A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 24th chapter. I forgot to mention during the announcements, we've gone to a liturgy setting one in the LBW, and so I apologize. But that's where these responses are coming from, so thank you for your patience. Matthew 24. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came. And took them away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day our Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming... He would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Advent, this word Advent, that shows up in our literature and our liturgical calendar this time of year, Advent, it means coming, coming. What in the name of God is coming into our lives? That we would be asked to stay awake, that we would be asked to keep watch for what is coming. I want to go back to early Christianity, when times like this, when seasons like this were more a part of the people's experience of life. If you think about those living, especially in Europe and the northern hemisphere during this time of year, what is coming upon the people? We have it coming upon us too, but see, we avoid it because we have electricity and we keep our world really lit up, don't we? Drive down the streets right now. Who doesn't have lights on in their yard or on their trees or in their bushes already? What is it that we are trying to fend off? What is it that we are trying to avoid? Darkness. Darkness is coming upon the northern hemisphere at this time of year. And so what was the people's response in the face of that? We wait for the light. We long for the light when the days grow longer. And that happens right after Christmas. So we have this period of December, these four weeks, that help us to prepare for those longer days, that coming of the light. And how did the early people do it? Originally, Advent was actually a season of fasting and preparing, and focusing, and reflection on sin, on that which separates us from God, that which leaves us in the darkness. And people would fast, because think about it, it has a practical aspect. Food becomes scarce. Hunting ceases. And if you want to make your food sources last through the winter, as you're hiding out in your cave, or as you're hiding out in in some kind of a lean-to or maybe a makeshift house, you've got to fast. You've got to reduce your intake of food. That's what the people did, but they made it a spiritual practice. Unencumbering their lives from food opened their hearts up to relying on God, to understanding the source 
of their life and the one who provides for them when the light grows longer. And so in our prayer, we talk about the coming of the light, waiting for the growing light, for growth, for nourishment, for wholeness, for health. That's a part of our prayer too. And so it's an interesting dynamic that we have going on in our world right now, isn't it? This past week I tuned into the radio, well more particularly over the last couple of days. I tuned into the radio a couple of times and what came on the radio to remind me of the season? You better watch out, you better not cry, you be jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all. This is the music of our culture at this time of the year. Why? What does that communicate to us? Spend money. No, wait. Um, get out of your houses. Be joyful. Be happy. Is there anything in that that talks about preparing ourselves for a new way of being? We love to live in the moment, don't we? We love to have immediacy and immediate gratification. And that's what our music is telling us in our culture. But I would suggest that the music of our scriptures is something very different. The music of our scriptures talks about beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. It talks about taking weapons and tools of destruction and division and separation and turning them into implements of peace and nurturance, and unity, and shalom. Come, let us, descendants of Jacob, walk in the light of the Lord. Let us prepare for war no more. Coming. What is coming into our midst, my friends? Today, we have a choice before us. In this Advent time, are we preparing for peace? Are we preparing for a Lord who proclaims unity and connectedness? Or do we continue to lose ourselves in the music of consumerism? Our scriptures call us to something very Serious. Changing our lives. You know, I love this psalm that we hear today. It was the psalm that pilgrims, religious pilgrims, would sing as they entered the gates of Jerusalem to go to the temple. You remember that image we had of the temple last week? And we talked about the disciples standing, not last week, two weeks ago, the disciples standing at the foot of the temple, overwhelmed with its awesomeness. And we hear these pilgrims walking into Jerusalem, crying out, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. Here is the place of peace. Why? Because those pilgrims were leaving lives of chaos leaving lives that were threatening and difficult and hard, working the ground and working the stones, eking out a life and a living, they came to Jerusalem to know peace. And they went to the temple to commune with their God. It was a place of grace for them. 
drawn there by their faith, drawn there to seek refuge, just as Noah did with his family, seeking refuge in that ark where they found life. So the pilgrims would go to Jerusalem to find life in the temple. Both images, the temple and the ark, images for the church, the ecclesia, the place where people come together out of chaos, out of separation, out of divisiveness, into a place of unity, harmony, shalom. There's an author by the name of John Shea who reflects on this experience a little bit as we enter in to this Advent, reflecting about people, pilgrims, ourselves, who come together to this place of grace to wait and to look and to notice and to be called into change. He says, the more deeply one enters into the experience of the sacred, the more one is aware of one's own personal evil and the destructive forces in society. The fact that one is alive to what is possible for humankind sharpens one's sense that we are fallen people. The awareness of sin is the inevitable consequence of having met grace. This grace Judgment dynamic reveals at the center of Christian life is repentance. This does not mean that the distinguishing mark of the Christian is breastfeeding, feeling sorry, acknowledging guilt and prolonged regret may be components of the human condition, but they are not what Jesus means by repentance. Repentance is the response to grace that overcomes the past and opens out to a new future. Repentance distinguishes Christian life as one of struggle and conversion and pervades it, not with remorse, but with hope. The message of Jesus is not just repent, but repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So we enter into this Advent season, recognizing that the kingdom of God is at hand. And because of that, we beat swords and plow into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. And we prepare for peace and shalom. We strive to leave the chaos of our lives to come together in that promise of the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but as I talk to people entering into this time of the year, that is the thing I hear, especially families, especially young parents say, this is so chaotic. It's so overwhelming. I feel like I'm supposed to be in three places all the time. What did we do to ourselves? How did we create this situation? What do we turn to in these times of chaos and being overwhelmed and distress? I mean, you can name the things that people turn to. It's been happening forever, but it's, it's heightened now in this culture of consumerism. Options, plenty, bounty, Luther reflected on this very dynamic when he spoke about the first commandment. He said, you know, in distress, what you turn to is your God. And if you're turning to alcohol, if you're turning to sex, if you're turning to materialism, if you're turning to shopping, if you're turning to lighting up your world to avoid the darkness, to live in denial, that is your God. But it is not 
the true God. We heard that list in that second reading from Paul. Those things that people turn to. Lawlessness and chaos and violence and self-absorption and greed. Those become people's gods, but those are not the true God. That's not the God we are called to prepare for, who has, in fact, already come to us and is coming to us. So, you know, to return to that image of light for us because we have electrical light, we oftentimes talk about light as enlightenment, knowing something, growing in our understanding of something. But I would suggest that our challenge is to unlearn our dependence on light and things and to return to that dependence on God that comes with a simplification, that comes with an unencumbering. And that's the word that I had put in front of you as an invitation during this time of Advent, to intentionally unencumber your lives so you can notice how God has already come to you to be grateful and to continue to look for the ways God is revealing God's self to you in this Advent season? What will you get rid of in order to make way for greater trust in God? What tools of false security will you remove from your lives intentionally over the next four weeks? Because if you do this, you will create a new habit, a new way of being, a new way of living in the world. It can make a difference, a real difference in your life. Maybe you want to unencumber yourself by letting go of grudges or by ceasing to take drugs or avoiding certain kinds of drugs. And I include alcohol in that. Maybe to remove recipe books that keep you thinking about food and the comfort of food or the overindulgence of food. Maybe to let go of some old clothes associated with a former body image that you had. Maybe it's to let go of an assault rifle or maybe to let go of worry about others' opinions and other people's expectations for you. Maybe it's to let go of needing to be right all the time. You know, to reflect on what you can unencumber your life from may open you up to a new way of being because it's not about doing more. Our preparations for the growing light are not about having more. They're not about improving yourself. It's about recognizing how God is already loving you and living in you and in your midst. So contrast your expectations and your experience during this season of Advent and live in the truth of the season. When you hear the sound of jingle bells, for some that can bring delight and excitement and for others it brings dread and anxiety. An anvil strike for some people sounds an alarm, it sounds caustic, but in fact, it could be the activity of one who is preparing for peacemaking and nurturing and shalom. How will you engage in that music? Regardless, we are asked to set our hearts and minds on the activity of a God who comes to us first, who pours himself out to us first, walking with his people, creating through us and in us, walking with us in our suffering and our loss, but always, always bringing new life.